All right, so I would like to continue from where I uh, stopped yesterday and uh, perhaps uh, later I will cut on some other material depending on the time. So we were this, and, and I want to wrap up after this, the end of this lecture, I want to wrap up a little bit and just summarize what I tried to do in those first three lectures. So we are at the end of the third one, which deal with chemical kinetics. And uh, uh, we saw yesterday that there are some uh, simple methods like uh, the steady state approximation or quasi steady state, if you like, uh, of, uh, that uh, uses the idea that some intermediate species uh, are in, uh, uh, created and destroyed very quickly so that uh, instead of a, uh, a differential equation for the change of the rate of that uh, species, it's essentially uh, very small or equal to zero, and so you get an algebraic relation. And so that reduced the number of uh, uh, equations that you have to deal with. Similarly, uh, the method of, uh, the, the other method of uh, uh, equilibrium that I, uh, uh, I discussed. And now I want quickly to comment a little bit about the more novel methods that are used using, compu uh, using computers, so computational methods. So here is the mathematical problem that we are faced. Uh, we have a system of, uh, it's going to click again, so I don't know, you have to mute something here. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> I don't see it, so it should mute something. No, it's not on my computer. It was here. Uh, um, you try it. Mute. Now. OK. Now it's fine. Uh, so uh, this is the mathematical problem that we are faced. We have a homogeneous system that uh, uh, the vector C of uh, n uh, species, these are the concentration and the time rate of change of the concentration is described in general by some nonlinear uh, uh, relations uh, uh, f of C, starting with some initial conditions and uh, then uh, we want to uh, solve the system. So the idea is that uh, uh, you will be at some point near an equilibrium point. So suppose, suppose that this is the equilibrium point. So you can uh, linearize the system near the equilibrium point. So essentially what you're doing is sort of a Taylor expansion of the right-hand side uh, of, of the equation. So it's going to be the value of this uh, functional uh, of the concentration C at the equilibrium plus the deviation multiplied by the derivative evaluated at the equilibrium. And the derivative for a system is going to be the Jacobian, and so the, in other words, the derivative of all the uh, different fi with respect to the cj. So now these are known, and uh, you end up with a linear system. So if I rename c minus c equilibrium by say an unknown x, what I have to deal with now, it's a linear system of equation. And uh, uh, solving that linear system of equation, I mentioned a simple example yesterday, essentially is uh, finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and the solution will be of an exponential form like this. And so, uh, uh, the, the, in principle, this is how you want to solve it, but uh, uh, the idea is that uh, we can simplify this if we can diagonalize the matrix J, and the way to diagonalize it is essentially using the uh, matrix V formed by the eigenvectors and its inverse. The inverse is such that V multiplied by uh, V tilde, it's a simpler notation than V to the minus one, uh, is equal to the identity. So. 
uh, there is a method uh, that ha that's a method how you can linearize it. So you, what you do, you start with that system and you multiply it by v from both sides, and then uh, you multiply by the inverse. So at the end, what you get is that system simplify to one which is of this form, dz dt equal to lambda z, where lambda is simply a diagonal matrix that all, all it has is the eigenvalues along the diagonal and zero everywhere else. Now, why this is a simpler system than the original one, it's clear because every row has a simple, uh, it's a simple equation which is uncoupled from the rest and so you can easily uh, write the solution. Now, this z, of course, is related to the original concentration Simp uh, that should have been an X and not a C, sorry about that. Uh, and uh, it's uh, simply obtained by the inverse matrix, which is known because we know the eigenvalues. Uh, 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 so we know V tilde, and so that's what Z is. So this is the simpler system that you solve. And uh, uh, in components, as I said, it's uh, simply a uh, simple equation of first order, which are uncoupled from each other and the solution is simply an exponential. So uh, the idea is then uh, if you start with a system like this and you diagonalize it, then the important uh, part of finding the solution is this uh, uh, matrix that involve all the eigenvalues. Now remember that we saw in a few of the examples that you did yesterday that the eigenvalues are essentially the reciprocal of the time scale in the problem. So these uh, eigenvalues are the different uh, time scales. So uh, what uh, people uh, will do at this stage will just divide uh, uh, the matrix into those which are slow and those which are fast. And we call them the slow and the fast time, OK? Now, how do you divide that arbitrarily? It depends on whoever is doing it. So it, it's your choice. if. Uh, a certain value is considered small or large. There is no uh, mathematical theory behind it, okay? Uh, so uh, this is the, the, the step that is uh, involved the modeler to, to make a decision. And then what you have uh, is a, a system of algebraic equation, essentially, that uh, uh, so you see the equation, the, the left-hand side is zero, the derivative are zero, so you have just the algebraic equation uh, which de describes the fast time and then the slow time is described by some of the remaining differential. And this way you have reduced your system. So, uh, uh, and, the, and the fast time describes the slow intrinsic manifold which means uh, it's that surface in the n-dimensional system that you have where uh, the solution very quickly fall into. I show you b before an example, and I'll show you another example uh, soon, but if I go back to this picture that I have here, so this is, for example, uh, in, uh, in the three-dimensional system could be the manifold, and you see all the trajectories starting from different initial conditions fall very quickly to that manifold. So that manifold can approximate the solution uh, for uh, these three species, of course. Uh, and then um, a, a lower manifold is maybe this line, uh, this curve where all the solution fall into before getting to the equilibrium. And of course, the equilibrium itself is a manifold, but it's a zero order manifold. So you have the zero order, the first order, second order. Uh, and uh, uh, that's how you can uh, uh, build them. Uh, but of course, what you're interested in is to reduce the system to one, to one manifold that describe most of the uh, kinetics and then the slow uh, equation describe the rest. So here is an example of a three by three system which correspond to a reaction A go to B and B go to D. Uh, and uh, if you write the rates, it's simply those three equations, clearly B has, is uh, produced and consumed, so it appears here. And so if you write it in a matrix, that's the matrix of the coefficient. You see all the coefficients. And uh, if, you find, if you try to find the eigenvalues, you have to solve the determinant of uh, uh, this matrix equal to zero. 
And uh, the three eigenvalues in this case are 0, minus k2, and minus k1, okay? So uh, they are related to the rates, and one of them is 0. And the eigenvectors are, are these. So you can compute that. You can uh, then uh, go through the algebra that I suggested earlier. Uh, so you find this uh, uh, vector z, which is a combination, a certain combination of these uh, concentrations, okay? A priori, you don't know what they are, but this is a method to find those combinations where the system reduced to become a very simple one. Uh, this is the matrix of the eigenvalues in the diagonal, and uh, uh, the equations are simply first order equations that you can solve immediately, okay? So uh, the next uh, step is just, uh, well, I repeated this here so that you see it on the, on the screen, but uh, I just rewrote the three <laughs> equations that you have here in terms of the concentration. The first one, you see Z1 was the sum of the three, so D by DT, the sum of the three is zero, meaning that the, the sum of those three concentrations is always conserved. It's always a constant. The constant depends on the initial condition. Of course, I didn't specify it, so I could just call it alpha 1. Uh, and uh, this combination here is uh, decaying at this rate. And uh, similarly, the C1 divided by K1 minus K2 divide, the decay at this rate. So uh, this is really the uh, uh, interpretation of what's in this box, that the first combination is conserved, and this uh, uh, combination of concentration decay on a time scale k2 to the minus 1. Remember, it's a reciprocal of the rates. And uh, c1 uh, decay uh, on a time scale k1 to the negative 1. So um, uh, here I put the system again, and uh, what I'm trying uh, to say, suppose Let's take the example that k2 is very large, let's say. Okay, so if the rate k2 is very large, then this is approximately zero. And so this combination say that c2 is almost all the time equal to or proportional to c1 multiplied by this constant. So this is the low intrinsic manifold. In other words, instead of the trajectories going like this and sitting on this, this is the low manifold in this case, which is this, that's a straight line in the phase space. Uh, so what you're saying is if you start here, you very quickly fall here. So what you do instead of solving this differential equation, you project from this point to the manifold, from this point to the manifold, and so on. And then uh, the manifold describe the dynamics, the rest of the dynamics. So this is how, yes. Uh, that is uh, true. I think I put a comment somewhere here uh, that uh, you have to, uh, uh, they, they typically are always uh, uh, such in, in a chemical reacting system. You are concerned in a situation where, where you uh, have multiplicities because then uh, you have to modify this a little bit. But very often that's the case. Okay. At least this is the general idea. And uh, yes. Um, could you repeat the question before and after for the, for the camera? Well, the question was uh, if it's always the case that the eigenvalues are uh, 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 negative and uh, and there is no repeated eigenvalues. I added this, and I said that in most of situation of chemical kinetics, that is the case. But of course, that's a good question, and uh, one have to be concerned about that. Uh, so, um, uh, we went through this, I show you this example, uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, an example taken from the, lit taken from the literature where uh, simple hydrogen-oxygen kinetic mechanism that involve uh, six uh, species and this uh, six reactions, and what you can see here uh, also is plotted the concentration uh, actually, it's the number of moles, but it's the same thing uh, as a function of time. And you can see how different the time scale of the changes that occur. Certain things occur on a time scale 
uh, that uh, uh, is 10 to the minus 9 and some other 10 to the minus 3, right? So there is quite a disparity of, of things. And uh, in this example, what they have shown is that this is the uh, low intrinsic manifold. So you see if you start from uh, different initial condition, the green line show you the projection into the manifold and then the manifold essentially approximate the solution uh, at all other times. Okay, and we, we're done almost with uh, chemical kinetics. I just want to make a few additional comments about uh, stoichiometry. We started with a general reaction of this form, and we said that there is a relation between the change in number of moles uh, of any two species Ij, which is uh, as written in this expression, which we can also write in terms of, instead of, uh, of moles, in terms of mass, by just replacing Ni with Mi divided by the molecular weight. And so we can also write that in terms of mass fraction, and this is uh, the relation between any two species I and J. And I will use that soon. Uh, uh, in a more particular system that I would be focusing on. From uh, now on, I will always deal with only a global single reaction. I'm not dealing anymore with mechanisms and with detail mechanisms. So any, rea any, any oxidation is described by a single global reaction of this form. So if you have a, a, a hydrocarbon that is burning uh, in, in air or with oxygen, uh, it produces CO2 and water, uh, nu F and nu O will be the stoichiometric coefficient of the fuel in oxidizer, so they are always uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the stoichiometric of the, of the reactants, clearly. And then uh, you would have the product, uh, but the, the notation that I will use is fuel and oxidizer, clearly. And uh, so the general form of the reaction is fuel plus oxidizer <coughs> goes to product. And uh, if you uh, take uh, this expression and relate it by, uh, say, the fuel and oxidizer will uh, have uh, uh, the simple form uh, here, uh, right, which is a rewrite of this, uh, where uh, uh, nu F and nu O uh, are no, it's exactly that, right? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, there is no new F double prime and new O double prime. Yes? So, uh, in the CH and O system, we know that uh, the CO2 and H2 are going to be a product. Which is right. Uh, but if you take any other reactant that's not the CH uh, as a fuel, is that something else? So, there will be whatever the product are. Well, if the, if the reaction go to completion, that's what you have. How, how would you predict it? Hmm? How would you predict it without having an experiment? How would you know the product you expect? Well, but the, these are the products that you can produce in an equilibrium situation from uh, this reaction. This is known. It's not. So if it's hydrogen and oxygen, it's going to be water. In other words, but it's not really very important because I'm not going to focus on the product anyway uh, because the products for me, uh, in, when you look at the reaction as a single step, it's going to be the outcome that you compute uh, after you know how the whole system have evolved. So really in, in the modeling it doesn't matter. Typically, this is known. We know what the product of certain given reaction is. Um, if not, it has to be given from experimentalists, uh, say, or what, okay. So, uh, so I want to focus on this relation, and of course, we can integrate uh, uh, this uh, uh, from a given state to, uh, from a given state which I call, uh, which I uh, use, or I use a subscript U for it, okay? So U stand for <laughs> unburned. So I'm integrating from the unburned state up to a given state. So clearly uh, uh, what you get here is YF minus YFU divided by 
uh, nu F, W, F is equal to the same quantity for the oxidizer. Now, if uh, the reaction go to completion, meaning that there is no fuel or no oxidizer, neither fuel nor oxidizer left at the end of the reaction, and then the combustion product are CO2 and water, which means that YF and YO at that state is zero, right? Then uh, the ratio uh, is what I call nu, and uh, this is, uh, we said that uh, the mixture is in, it's a stoichiometric mixture. Okay, so nu is gonna be uh, a notation that I will use from now to the future. It's essentially the mass weighted stoichiometric coefficient. In other words, not how many moles divided by how many moles, we have a kilogram divided by how many kilograms. Oxidizer versus fuel, okay. Uh, another uh, notation which is used and uh, very, very, very often used in combustion is the stoichiometric, uh, is the equivalence ratio, sorry. The equivalence ratio phi is, is defined as the ratio of the fuel to the oxidizer that you have in the system uh, relative to the stoichiometric ratio, right, of, of fuel to oxidizer. The stoichiometric ratio, as we have seen before, is just nu F W F divided by nu O W O. So this is what the equivalence ratio is. Or if I use nu, it's going to be simplified as such. So now the equivalence ratio, it's a number that runs from zero to infinity. When phi is equal to one, then clearly uh, you are at stoichiometry, so it corresponds to a stoichiometric uh, mixture. When phi is less than one, there is less fuel than you need, so the system is lean. And uh, when phi is uh, bigger than one, the system is rich. So it's just a notation and uh, a definition of uh, equivalence ratio. Very often in practice, people use instead of fuel to oxidize, they use fuel to air. Essentially, it changes the number, but the idea is the same, phi equal to one, it's stoichiometry, less than one is lean, bigger than one is rich. Okay, so the next uh, thing I wanna quickly uh, uh, go through, and again, I'm sure that you have all heard about this and you know about it, but I just want to quickly uh, uh, go through it also because of the notation. Uh, adiabatic flame temperature. So if a given combustible mixture is made to go to equilibrium, to chemical equilibrium, uh, by means of a isobaric constant pressure, right? Adiabatic process, the end temperature is called the adiabatic temperature, the adiabatic flame temperature, okay? So the adiabatic flame temperature is the adiabatic temp it's the flame temperature or the adiabatic temperature under constant pressure. Uh, so under constant pressure, it means that the change in enthalpy is zero. So H unburn is H burn. And since H is uh, uh, by definition the uh, mass weighted uh, enthalpies of all the species, so uh, on the unburned side, it's going to be HIYI unburned. On the burn side, it's going to be the corresponding value for the burn. Now, remember that the enthalpy is the enthalpy, the reference enthalpy or the enthalpy of formation plus the uh, sensible enthalpy, which is the integral of CPI dt, right? Uh, and so uh, here it's written as CPU, so CP here is the CP of the mixture, right? Which we defined yesterday. So uh, this is on the unburned side, this is on the burned side. Now uh, if we choose the reference temperature to be uh, the, temp well, what I did here, I just moved this to the other side of the equation and put the two integrals on the same side, okay? And uh, now uh, uh, remember that I said CP is the CP of the mixture, so this is the definition of CP, right? So it's YI CPI, uh, either on the unburn or on the burn side, depending on uh, the left expression or the right expression. Uh, the next step is uh, to uh, go to the relation that uh, uh, we have between two species, I and J and in particular choose one to be the fuel. So let's say the J is the fuel. So for the fuel, I remember I, I denoted nu I prime by nu fuel and there is no uh, uh, double prime for it. 
And so this is what it simplifies. And if I uh, just uh, integrate from the unburned to the burned state and uh, put uh, the yi, so what you get is yi u minus yib. It's uh, this value multiplied by this ratio, which come from here to the right-hand side of the equation, right? So it's a straight uh, integration. And uh, now the, uh, the next uh, thing is to realize that the change uh, in enthalpy of formation uh, between, the un between the unburned side to the burned side is essentially related to the uh, heat of combustion, Q. Uh, and so uh, what you have, it's essentially that the heat of combustion uh, multiplied by these factors, but in a minute you'll see what it's simplified to, is equal to the integral uh, of the difference of uh, Cp on the burn side minus Cp on the unburned side, integrated from the reference temperature to Tb and uh, from the reference to In other words, this is the sensible enthalpy on the, in the cold mixture, and this is the sensible enthalpy of the uh, burn mixture. What we are interested in is to compute this Tb, right, which is the adiabatic flame temperature. The, so uh, uh, if uh, uh, all you, uh, so now if you choose the reference temperature to be the unburned temperature, you don't have to, but that's just a constant otherwise. But for simplicity, if you choose the reference temperature to be Tu, this is zero. And what you get here that this integral is equal to Q, and I just took those uh, factors to the right-hand side of the equation. And since uh, uh, I am uh, uh, interested to compute the adiabatic temperature, so I, I am in a situation where uh, YFB, in other words, all the fuel is consumed. So uh, uh, that's, in fact, relevant only for a lean system where all the fuel is consumed. So if uh, all the fuel is consumed, then uh, YFB is zero, and uh, this is the relation you get. Uh, so what you have to, to do is just, you know what Q is, that's a heat release. Uh, so you have to um, assume a certain value of Ta and uh, in, uh, evaluate the integral on the left-hand side. If it's equal to Q, fine. If not, iterate again until uh, you find the right Ta that satisfy the relation. Okay. Uh, if you rewrite this expression in terms of uh, molar heat capacity, it just simplifies to this. In other words, those factors are the factors that uh, make the change from mass to molar uh, uh, heat capacity. Uh, okay, uh, question? Yes? Okay, uh, no, the, the, uh, we are, uh, um, perhaps I didn't mention that, but I should have. We are uh, considering a situation where we have a pre-mixed system. So uh, the fuel and oxide are well mixed and they are at the same temperature. They are well mixed, well mixed at the molecular level already, okay? So in every parcel of fluid, there is both fuel and oxidizer at the same temperature, okay? And so, uh, uh, and so the distinction is not necessary. That will be relevant in diffusion flame, and I will eventually discuss that during the week. So, uh, uh, right, so the, it, it was an important point that I missed, uh, I was rushing through, and uh, I missed to say that we are focusing at the moment on pre-mixed uh, system. So, um, uh, this is the way to calculate essentially the adiabatic flame temperature. Uh, uh, what is this? Oh, I, this was just to show that uh, this relation, oops, that, uh, that these two are equivalent. Uh, it's a detail, I, d I don't need it. So uh, as a quick example, uh, if we uh, look at uh, methane uh, uh, and air, okay, and uh, note that we have uh, one mole of methane, but 15 moles of air, uh, then uh, uh, the products are gonna be 
Well, certain quantity of CO2, H2O, N2, and O2, and you can calculate this B1, B2, B3, B4 in this example because it's simple, uh, and you find that it's 1, 2, and so on. And so uh, now what we want is to calculate the adiabatic flame temperature. Uh, so the, we find that Q is equal to 802 kilojoule. It's found in tables. And uh, the specific enthalpies, uh, uh, this is found from knowing the specific enthalpies of methane, CO2, and H2O. Note that the specific enthalpy of uh, N2 and O2, of course, are zero because they are in their basic state as we uh, mentioned yesterday. So uh, we need the integral from unburned to the adiabatic temperature of uh, the different uh, uh, Cp multiplied by, of course, the stoichiometric coefficients uh, to be equal to this quantity, right, in order to satisfy this relation, okay? And so uh, if you choose, for example, uh, 2000 K, the left hand side is a little high, is a little uh, lower, it's a little higher, sorry, than the right hand side. So you have to lower a little bit the temperature. If you choose 1700, you are uh, uh, still, uh, you are still, what is it, a little, uh, a little higher. And so the, and so it turned out that 1732 is, is the value. Okay, so this is the way to compute the adiabatic temperature, and, uh, but uh, this is not quite accurate, actually. Uh, in other words, in reality, you will usually find that the adiabatic temperature is lower than this. And the reason for this, it's because we didn't, we didn't account for any pro product dissociation. And uh, today, there are different, uh, uh, you know, software that you can find to compute these things. Uh, with more accuracy. This is just uh, an example where uh, I have added uh, uh, some, of the, uh, dis some of the species dissociation. So you see, if you just add CO, it lowers a little bit. If you also add CO and O, it lowers a little more and so on. If you include uh, all these species, then it's approximately 1725 instead of 1732 which is a more or less the, the, the correct value. So anyway, I uh, just wanted to uh, briefly go through this uh, just for uh, clarity. Now, uh, in most of the uh, uh, theoretical discussion, uh, CP is going to be assumed constant. Okay, And so if you assume CP constant, it's very easy because then you can perform the integral. C is, uh, CP is outside, so the integral is just Cp multiplied by Tb minus To, and if To is Tu, then uh, it's just Tb minus Tu. So then you get, in this case, an exact analytical expression for the adiabatic flame temperature, which is very convenient for, of course, analytical studies. Remember that we have obtained this by assuming that the fuel is totally consumed, which is only the case of a lean system. If you have a rich system, I have to redo this whole step, but then assume that the oxidizer is the one which is completely consumed. It's easy to do, and you end up with an expression like this, which is clear by a symmetry to the one on top, that instead of uh, Y uh, fuel unburned, you will have Y oxidant unburned. Okay. And what if you are at stoichiometry? Clearly, those two expressions are identical, as they should. Okay, so in general, uh, this is the uh, expression for the adiabatic flame temperature for lean and rich. I wrote here uh, a symbol that say it's approximate, approximate in the sense that, of course, Cp is constant and so on, okay? But otherwise, you can think of this as equal to. As I said, the two expressions are identical when phi is equal to 1, and uh, typically this is what uh, the adiabatic temperature will look like. It will peak at or near, uh, this expression will peak exactly at, but when you have dissociation, it can be shifted a little bit. So it peaks near uh, uh, stoichiometry, and then uh, it drops uh, uh, when the mixture is lean or when the mixture is rich. And those uh, red lines are essentially the flammability limits. At some point, the mixture is no longer flammable, and uh, uh, then the, 
there is no uh, combustion. So uh, this was a, a quick run into some of these uh, 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 terms, adiabatic temperature, equivalence ratio, and so on. And uh, just a quick mention of the constant volume equi equilibrium temperature. Remember that I uh, said that adiabatic flame temperature is a flame temperature under, uh, under isobaric condition, under constant pressure. What if, the, uh, if I take uh, the same mixture but in a constant volume and let it go to completion now under constant volume, not constant pressure? Well, uh, of course, it's the uh, internal energy which is conserved in this case. And if you go through the same exercise, you end up with a burn temperature which is a little different than the previous one. Just to remind you, the previous one was here, uh, the heat release was divided by Cp, and now the heat release is divided by Cv. Now remember that Cp is always larger than Cv. So if Cv is smaller, it means that the temperature is higher. So you, under constant volume, you're going to get an equilibrium temperature which is higher than under constant pressure. Uh, under constant pressure, we usually do not call this the adiabatic flame temperature, but it's clearly it's also an adiabatic flame temperature, but it's under constant volume. Okay, so uh, this is the end of this lecture, and uh, uh, before I uh, move to the next one, I wanted to just uh, make some uh, general. Uh, comments and um, uh, you know I went I ran through uh, quite a bit of things here uh, uh, in the derivation of the equations and uh, in many of the assumptions made etc and uh, my uh, idea was really to uh, first of all show you uh, the way that you start from uh, uh, say a, a pure substance and then you can generalize the idea to a mixture and that in a mixture you have uh, other complexities that show up uh, for example uh, how to determine or how to identify the different species in a mixture the introduction of concentration mass fraction and so on but then uh, there are also issues like diffusion that come into the picture and we need some phenomenological laws or some uh, uh, constitutive relation to determine the diffusion velocities. And I've tried to show you that even though there is a big expression uh, known uh, to be uh, uh, quite accurate that describe uh, uh, the relation between diffusion velocity and concentration and mass fraction, it's a very uh, cumbersome relation, very rarely used uh, in full generality. So often we use the Stefan Maxwell relation and I uh, just told you or tried to show you at least what are the things that are simplified to obtain this. And then even the Stefan Maxwell relation are complicated because they're not exactly on the form that we uh, want to have in the differential equation. They are in an implicit way. Uh, and so there we introduce things like a dilute mixture. But when you introduce this, or for example, when you see papers that uh, write and use uh, fixed law for diffusion, well, remember that there is an approximation there. And you have to really understand what is the meaning of the diffusivity in that approximation. They are not always uh, the same as uh, from the original uh, uh, full uh, relation of in the Stefan Maxwell relation. If you use the effective diffusivity, you have to understand what's the meaning. So I wanted to bring this to your attention. Of course, in two or three hours that I spent with you over this, you cannot grasp all the details of this, but at least I think you should be aware that the, there are these simplifications. I wanted to show you the different form of the energy equation that uh, uh, is used. Uh, we have used it in terms of internal energy, total energy. We remove the kinetic energy. Sometimes we want to leave it in, sometimes not. Enthalpy, entropy, and so on. So uh, I wanted more to bring the, the, these uh, uh, things to your attention. And similarly, issues about chemical kinetics that really complicates the system significantly. And even though we're going to only use global reaction 
fuel plus oxidizer go to product, and that's why the detail of the product will not really uh, matter to me very much here. Uh, uh, still, uh, it was important to understand that in reality, things are more complicated than that, okay? And how they can complicate the discussion. So, uh, there are multiple, just one second, there are multiple ways of uh, characterizing combustion or classifying combustion system. One of them is to make a distinction between premixed and non-premixed. So, premixed is the fuel and oxidizer are intimately mixed already before combustion start. Uh, they are mixed at uh, the molecular level, meaning that every fluid element or particle that we take, there is already fuel and oxidizer there. That's not always the situation. Of course, there are situations where the fuel is on one end, the oxidizer is the other end, and uh, uh, they will burn only when they meet and mix. So the first they are referred to as premixed, the latter is usually referred to as non-premixed or diffusion flame, and we're going to talk about diffusion flame later. Another classification between flames and detonation, or deflagrations and detonation, and we're going to talk today uh, in the next hour about uh, 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 the difference between these two classifications. Of course, you can also classify things as homogeneous combustion, where combustion occur in a gaseous uh, situation, or you have a heterogeneous uh, system where you have uh, also solid particles that can be fuel or can be just inert, or droplets, so you have liquid gas uh, mixture, uh, and that's another possible classification. Uh, of course, one can also classify between laminar and turbulent, but that's also a, a, a way to uh, distinct uh, different processes. Yes? When you have? A secondary, a secondary what? Secondary air. Uh, so secondary what? Secondary. Yeah, okay. Is it applicable the same as when you have? But what is applicable? I mean, when you have a secondary air, the, presumably the primary is well mixed, and so the secondary uh, can uh, burn whatever is left over. Well, but that's uh, then uh, it's not pre it's not fully premixed to start with. No, it is. It's pre it is. Uh, okay, but w then when you s when you ask, is it applicable? What is applicable? When you don't have the total oxidizer quantities premixed with the with the fuel at the two stages of the fuel, one stage with the primary and the subsequently you have secondary. Right, but, but you see what you're describing now, it's a particular configuration which depend on the flow system and on how uh, they are introduced uh, on the boundary condition and so on. And so far we didn't touch on any of that. We were only talking about just the homogeneous system that burn and so the adiabatic temperature was relevant to that. and. Uh, so this relates to a more a particular configuration that you have to define uh, before uh, uh, you can address if it's applicable or not, or what is applicable. Um, okay, so I have 10 minutes <laughs> to start lecture four, but uh, let's go through some of it, and then we will take a break. Uh, so uh, the... Uh, b by the way, it's also interesting that uh, the first fuel, I mean, I say that in uh, the class I teach in Illinois, uh, uh, you know, the first fuel lecture seems very complicated because really we put all the complexities, the equations are uh, partial differential equation, highly complicated and so on. But now we start, uh, you know, with simpler systems. So uh, even the mathematics is simpler, but even the configurations are simpler. So uh, the first thing that we want to do is to look at one-dimensional flow. So we have uh, 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 a, situation, oops, a situation which is described here. Uh, we have a plane a steady, it's, it's pre-mixed, okay? Everything now today is pre-mixed. So the, we have a, 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 a one-dimensional flow. We have a region where 
everything happen, all the species diffusion, heat conduction, chemical reaction, viscous dissipation, and so on. And uh, the question, uh, and uh, uh, far to the left, we have a mixture with uh, given pressure, density, temperature, and we know the different mass fraction, and the mixture is at rest, uh, at rest U naught is zero. And uh, then there is uh, possibly a wave that propagate from uh, to the left at some velocity consuming that mixture. So we want to ask the question, what kind of such waves are possible? And if that's the case, then they leave behind pressure density temperature, which is denoted by the subscript infinity. And so the question, the objective of this uh, discussion is to determine the state of the burn gas, in other words, how these values relate to the initial uh, values, and of course the wave speed. What is the, the speed V naught that this wave propagate, uh, the wave speed propagate into the quiescent mixture? Uh, it's equivalent. So this is the picture in the laboratory and uh, in the which is on top, but we can also look at this in a frame attached to the wave. So if you move with the wave, what you're going to see is uh, uh, the the mixture coming at you at velocity v naught, and the way and everything will be steady or stationary here, and uh, not stationary but steady. And uh, and then uh, of course there is. Uh, uh, the gas on the right will be moving at some velocity v infinity. Now, uh, the wave speed, remember, was uh, minus v naught, so these correspond to the velocity relative to the wave, and if you are interested in the fluid particle, then it's obtained by u equal to v plus the wave speed, right? So, for example, the fluid particle here will be v minus v naught, which v naught minus v naught, which is zero. In other words, the particle is far away at rest, and here it's going to be whatever it's obtained by this combination. Okay, so uh, if uh, in this uh, steady formulation we want to write the governing equation, uh, one dimension steady. So uh, here are the uh, simplified equation that you obtain, the mass conservation. Uh, the equation for the momentum equation, uh, the equation for the, uh, the energy equation written in terms of the enthalpy, the species equation, equation of state. Those are all the equations that uh, uh, we have, and uh, they are uh, described with the same notation and before. Q here is the heat flux, okay? I did not specifically write what it is. Uh, and these vi are the diffusion velocity. I don't have to specify at the moment uh, uh, the specific uh, relation, uh, uh, fix or whatever relation. Okay, so uh, uh, this equation can be manipulated to be written as the complete differential of some quantity. The first one is obvious. d by dx over rho v is zero, so it's, it's obvious. The second one, uh, uh, need uh, a little of, uh, uh, to massage it a little bit because uh, uh, this term here, well, basically what you use is the fact that rho v is a constant and you bring it uh, in, which is written here already. So this one is, is, uh, is also a full derivative. Uh, and the third one need a little work. But anyway, they can be written as the total derivative d by dx of something equal to zero, which immediately means that I can integrate them. So the first one tell me rho v is constant, the second one is this quantity is constant, the third one is whatever it's in this parenthesis is constant, and so on. Now if it's a constant, I can then evaluate it at negative infinity, where I know the value, and at positive infinity, where I don't know the value, and find the relation between uh, negative infinity and positive infinity. So here it is, right? The first relation, or the first relation, which oops, which was uh, rho v will be rho naught v naught is equal to rho infinity v infinity. Uh, here is the momentum equation. Here is the energy equation. Well, what happened to? Sorry, I had to run through. The, what happened to these? Uh, 
uh, other terms here, like uh, this derivative here and uh, Q and uh, the diffusion velocity. Well, at plus infinity and minus infinity, everything is uniform. In other words, it doesn't change in X anymore. In other words, sufficiently far, uh, the mixture is, uh, is uh, moving uh, uniformly. And so uh, Q, which is uh, the gradient of temperature, must go to zero. Similarly, the diffusion velocity, which is a gradient of concentration, must go to zero. So, and similarly, dvdx goes to zero. So well, that's why all the derivatives vanish, and so the only thing left is what you have here. And what happened to the species equation? Well, the species equation, uh, remember, well, sorry, I have to go again through this. Uh, the species equation, uh, is not equal to zero that I can integrate, so I left it as it is. Now, when I evaluate it from when I evaluate it from negative infinity to plus infinity, what I get is that essentially the omega i must be zero on one side, and omega i must be zero on the other side. So this is what I wrote here. Okay, and finally, the question of state can be written as such. Okay, remember that uh, the, uh, the gas constant can be replaced by gamma and Cp, so this is the form that uh, you get. So uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the, re the, the algebraic relation that relates the, uh, the, the quantities far to the left and quantities far, far to the right. We are going to assume that all the CPI are the same, all the molecular weights are approximately the same. And so under this uh, condition, the difference in enthalpy between the burn end and the unburn side is going to be equal to essentially the heat release plus the sensible uh, uh, change in enthalpy, which can be uh, uh, the integrals here are evaluated, so that's what it, it is. So uh, I can replace this uh, change in H by minus Q and uh, CPT infinity minus T naught. Uh, and uh, okay, and so uh, what we will uh, uh, do next is uh, uh, just um, uh, uh, use the, uh, th these three relation to in fact reduce them to only two uh, which are written here, rho naught v naught from continuity is equal to rho naught v inf rho infinity v infinity, and that's equal to essentially the mass flux, right? M. So M is a constant, and uh, when you substitute it in the momentum equation, you get uh, this relation that show that the difference between the pressure on the uh, right side and the left side divide by the reciprocal of the density or the specific volume, if you like, on one side to the other is equal to minus m squared. This is known as the Rayleigh line. The second relation that comes from the energy equation, essentially, again, it needs to be manipulated in order to uh, remove the temperature and express it in terms of pressure and density only, is known as the Hugonium. So what we have left is the, all these relations reduced to two relations, the Rayleigh line and the Gonio, and these determine the end state. So if you start with an initial state, rho naught, p naught, t naught, so on, and you, know, you want to know the end state, you have to solve these two relations. So it's convenient to present the result in a diagram that consists of P versus the reciprocal of rho. But before doing that, it's, uh, uh, it's convenient to work with dimensionless variable. So what uh, you do, you divide, uh, you divide P infinity by P naught, rho infinity by rho naught, in order to use the initial state as reference. And, and uh, P rho without any subscript is essentially the ratio. Okay, so here is the Hugonio and uh, the second one and the Rayleigh line written in dimensionless form, okay? Uh, now, when you write them in dimensionless form, you have dimensionless parameter. One of them is the heat release parameter, Q. So here Q is no longer the heat flux, 
there is no confusion really to be made because we are not going to use the heat flux in this discussion. So this Q is the heat release parameter, sorry, but there are only a certain number of uh, 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 letters that you can use and you don't want to use notation that confuse you, so it's convenient to use small Q for heat release, which is the large Q. Okay, so this is the, and the A naught here is the speed of sound, okay, which we have defined before. So essentially it was from P over rho, so, okay, so P naught over rho naught. And uh, mu is uh, essentially a rewrite of the mass flux, but uh, made dimensionless. So this is a quantity that uh, doesn't have dimension. In other words, numerator and denominator have the same dimension. Okay, so uh, uh, again, so this is the system that give us PV, right? And uh, once you compute PV, you can easily compute rho t from the remaining equation, which is a question of state and uh, continuity equation. Uh, for a given mu, in other words, if you know mu, you can compute from here P and V. Remember that the initial state correspond, or the, uh, the state upstream correspond to P equal to V equal to one based on this dimensionalization, right? Okay, uh, two comments to make before we uh, try to look for the solution. And the first comment is that uh, mu has made uh, here dimensionless. Uh, if you just uh, express it in terms of, uh, if you just know that P naught over rho naught is in fact the, the speed of, oh, it's proportional to the speed of sound uh, square, and the numerator is V naught square after you divide or multiply by rho naught, well, you see that mu is essentially equal to gamma times the upstream Mach number, okay? M square is the ratio of uh, the speed divided by the speed of sound. So, and not to signify that it's at negative infinity. So mu is basically the upstream Mach number. But you can also express mu uh, in terms of the downstream Mach number, but then it's going to be multiplied by the local pressure divided by specific volume. So this, again, is another important relation, okay? So the two relations are framed here. Mu can be either expressed in terms of the upstream Mach number or the downstream Mach number, uh, and there is a relation between downstream and upstream Mach number. That's important to know because later we can use this for uh, our uh, uh, discussion. So let's take a break of uh, 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Let's be on time so we continue.